Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Clark. I'm a birder from South London. So this is a summation, a description. We, we're going to be about 40, 50 minutes, and and then hopefully there'll be some time for questions. Um, this is a, a, a summation, a description of my volunteer work at the Poda Bird Reserve in Bulgaria. I went there for a month in COVID year 2020, and it coincided with the September migration on the Via Pontica fly, fly went um, in April, which coincided with the um, spring migration on the. And what a, is this is sort of dis, description of, uh, of of how the presentation is going to go. Um, I want to just briefly go over the European migration routes because we get very excited this end. Um, in the UK when spring comes and we get our migratory birds and again around this time of year August September time when we get the autumn migration but there are other European migration routes indeed there are obviously migration routes across the world then I want to talk about the Poda Reserve which you can see there that's the centre um, and how that fits in to the uh, Via Pontica flyway then of course we'll have some exciting slides hopefully about some of the birds that you're likely to see at that reserve or in that area um, then i'm briefly going to go across some negative human effects that are on birds that i saw at the reserve um, which is sort of like examples of what happens because of pollution and indeed an interesting topical fact uh, the 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 war in ukraine and how that has affected um, animals um, and then a, a little bit about my volunteer work which was basically engagement which is basically you know, talking to people um, and then we'll have a, any questions and answers let's go let's talk about the three major routes in europe i hope hopefully that graphic is um pretty uh, clear on your screens so on our route on so the if you look to the left hand side of the screen this is the route that british migrating birds would take typically they're coming from west africa some of them will be coming from um um, uh, a region called the sahel which is underneath the sahara desert the sort of yellow piece that's stretching across africa there and then going either straight across the sahara or hugging the coast of west africa going across the straits of gibraltar through spain france um and if they don't um, start breeding there, then they'll come all the way into GB and, and maybe even onto Scandinavia. And equally, if they're on when they're leaving back to their wintering grounds, they'll be coming back through um, France and Spain, going through again the Straits of Gibraltar and going back to their wintering grounds in Africa. The Central European Adriatic route, the, the, the central graphic in the picture, so the birds some of the birds obviously on all three routes would will be very long distance migrants coming all the way from south africa that's that arrow that you can see going all the way up to almost the sahara so yes the adriatic route so again a lot of the birds will be well most of the birds will actually be having to cross the sahara they won't be hugging the west african coast and then they will be taking the short sea route the shorter sea route um through tunisia the back end, uh, the bottom end of Italy, and then going through to Central Europe, and and some of the birds will be carrying on to Scandinavia. And equally, again, there will be a autumn migration following the arrows downwards. Whereas the Via Pontica is much more to do with East Africa. So you can see that the the, the arrows there they're coming from Kenya, Tanzania, some parts of Central Africa. Some of the birds are again like our, like the Western Flyway, uh, uh, missing the Sahara Desert by hugging the coast, and some, but some decide to uh, indeed do cross the Sahara. Then they then cross into the Middle East and they go into Turkey. Some will start breeding there. Some will, uh, some will then carry on through Turkey, going across the small sea part of the Bosphorus and then on through Bulgaria, Romania, and some of the birds will carry on as, um, right up to Latvia, Lithuania. But interestingly, on this flyway, 
the if we think of it as a funnel at the top as well as a funnel at the bottom and then there's this sort of narrow bit which i'm going to talk about which goes through bulgaria if we think of the funnel at the top it's absolutely massive it goes um for some of the uh, the long distance migrants it's going all the way from eastern germany right across russia right across the crimea the caucasus um so it's a really big di large distance and equally you can see in the middle you'll see the the, the left hand fork which um, goes around bulgaria there's a, uh, there's a right hand fork as well so some of these birds will also be taking the right hand edge uh, of the black sea which is an incredibly important route for raptors going through georgia so what these routes you notice on all three the birds are trying to avoid water and so they're what they're trying to do is find the narrowest part so on the western route it's the straits of gibraltar on on the via pontica they're going through the bosphorus and particularly on the via pontica there's a lot of large birds which we, we will see that are on this migration route birds like dorks um, pelicans and the larger raptors and what they're using also, they like hugging the sides of the Black Sea because you've got a difference in temperature between the water mass and the land, which creates lots of thermals um, and uh, which aids, the, aids their, their, their progress and minimizes the amount of energy they're going to use. Because some of the, some, uh, certainly pelicans, they can actually do 500 kilometers um, in one one day okay so let's narrow down this view of pontica and talk more about where it was so the the actual center the the uh, oda center is very close to borgas um spelt in both ways it's a bit confusing when you're booking your flights um and burgas is the largest port in bulgaria it's on the edge of the black sea um the it's in, on, and the centre is about six kilometres south from there. And as I said, it's this wonder. It's a very important place. This whole area, not just the reserve, but the whole Burgas area, is really important migratory. It's where the funnel narrows before it then stretches out, um, going northwards, and before it stretches out, going southwards through turkey when the birds are on the way back actually at this moment um although a lot of the uh, it's very similar timing to our migration um a lot of the birds will be going back but now they will be getting what we're getting will be, they'll be getting wintering ducks they'll be getting the swan species they'll be getting geese species coming through this flyway Okay, so the Poda, I, I hinted the Poda location, the, the, the reserve itself is about six kilometres south. Um, it's not very well marked because I've just, I put a little cross where it is. I hope you can all see it. Uh, but what I, why I've put this slide in is because the reserve, it's a marshland reserve. Think of rain and marshes. It's very similar to rain and marshes in the habitat. Um, but we can see here, that it's also wonderfully placed, not just because of the migration route, but it's got two, well, it's got three very big lakes and a sea. So it's right on the, the westerly edge of the Black Sea, which we can see to the right. But on the left, um, the southwest is Lake Mandra, massive lake. A bit farther north is Lake Borgas itself. Um, and then the, the thinner lake that you see at the top, still a very big lake, is that. Atanasovsko uh, Lake, which is uh, a wonderful place in itself because that's where you will get the flamingos because it's a salt, um, salt pan lake. Um, and in fact, if you look where it says Burgas on the map to the right, you'll see a dark green area. And that's the city. It's a seven kilometer strip of city park. Is a wonderful walk, so it's uh, you go through it's like an any urban park that you might meet in Europe, um, except it's right by the Black Sea coast. And then when you get to the end of the walk at the north side, you've got this wonderful lake with lots of waders and flamingos. Okay, so that's that's let's get into talking about Poda, the center 
itself. So Poda's actually a Ramsar site, so it's a wetland of international importance. Um, it uh, was inaugurated in 1988, um, and we to recognise that the BSPB, the Bulgarian Society for Protection of Birds, was only, was only inaugurated in 1987. They only have been the first one the Rodo Mountains on the, in the west of Bulgaria, which is famous for um, breeding vulture. Um, so it's important in three ways. It, it's obviously like an RSPB centre. It's an important place for engagement, um, getting people involved with birds and enjoying them. But it's also important for bird monitoring. They, um, Peter Yankov, um, one of the leaders there, uh, he's written many papers. He's a very famous Bulgarian ornithologist, and he also inaugurated um, the first Bulgarian um, breeding bird atlas. And they're now start. They're, they're now along the way to. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't say halfway through, but there will be a new bird atlas coming out in the next couple of years. That's another important part of this centre is the bird monitoring and the bird monitoring obviously also uh, is, is carried out in the local area as well. There's also bird research, a lot, a lot of research on um, birds into power lines. There's a lot of industry, in, industry around the area. There's a lot of power lines in the area and a lot of big birds suffer. Um, in fact, smaller birds, we'll see that later, suffer from actually impacting into those um, power lines. You can see the the mission fee is about a couple of quid, I think. I think there's, I'm, I'm not sure, it's, it's a, the Bulgarian lev, there's about three to the pound. Um, and here we have a nice overview, fisheye overview of the site. So again, think of rain and marshes, very similar habitat, marshland, a lot of pools, a lot of which contain brackish water. There are some freshwater pools as well. A lot of reed bed, um, and the difference with Rainham is instead of having the River Thames, you've got the Black Sea and these two lakes, which you can see on the left. Uh, and you've also got to, you can see there's some pylons there as well. A bit of it, um, it, it is actually a, a, a post-industrial site, which I'll talk a little bit about later. This is the the driveway into the reserve. On the left, where this green scrub is 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 the Mandra Lake and the, there's a man, obviously a man-made canal that goes, the bridge is going over a canal which links the lake to the Black Sea and then as we drive up another 100 metres there's the the centre itself. They've, uh, so, so you've got, as you can see, uh, people's, people, a, a lot of people who come to the centre don't actually go on to the reserve, they just stay and watch the migration in the skies from the two viewing platforms. Um, I slept, if you see the window on the left, that was my little room where I slept. It's a self-contained centre, so you have the main entrances on the right and there's a little shop where you can get coffee and beer um, and snacks and buy your bird books and your bird t-shirts. Um, and it's got a kitchen and shower facilities and but they built on a little bit more accommodation on the left and now there's also a cover on the first uh, level there and I can't really accentuate enough about it being a protected area um, so it's it's like any bird reserve it's got a, three hides these are the public hides there's another one which is a photographic hide uh, which um, um, photographers just for themselves and the public can't go in. That, that comes up a little bit more expensive, but you do get, because the migration route is so important, you do get professional photographers using that hide. This slide is trying to give you um, a flavor of, of, of the feel of the habitat on site. So there's obviously lots of marshland, there's, there's lots of reed bed, there's a lot of scrub up the main path, a lot of long grass, very little mature trees uh, most of them are actually quite um, short mat uh, mat mature scrub if you look on the left hand um, picture you'll see in the background past the bit of marshland you'll see 
that bit of scrubland, that absolutely gets full of cormorant nests, um, enormous amounts, um, which surprised me. I didn't realise that they would be um, nesting so low. Um, and then this is a view from when you were on uh, the roof of the actual centre, um, because you, you're not necessarily always looking at the skies. You're looking over the, the bit of water in the background is the Black Sea. Um, but interestingly there, there's a breakwater that goes two or 300 metres, and that's really interesting. You get a really a big build-up of water birds, ducks and gulls and terns and the odd pelican there. And, and if you're lucky, an osprey hunting there and that breakwater the actual water that the little bit of water that you can see coming towards the reserve is actually very shallow uh, but it's full of fish and it's really easy easy pickings for fish eating birds and then after the breakwater it gets quite deep um, and so it, it helped me because one of the things i was doing was actually um finding out what birds were on site day by day because it had changed because it was migration both times I was there. Um, and I'd do a basic count in the morning. I'd go on the reserve before the centre was open. But because we're facing the east, the sun would always be in my eyes. So I wouldn't do the breakwater. I'd do that late afternoon when the sun had gone down and, and, and try and count all the... Well, actually, this last time, it was enormous amounts of sandwich turns along with um, little turns and Caspian turns. Okay, and then as you walk up the path, you actually brush up right against the Black Sea, and it's quite benign. There's very, very little. It, it, it does get windy at times, but you don't. It, you still only get ripples, um, and it's quite a nice morning walk, early in the morning walk, just hearing the lapping of the waves and the and, and, and this this spring the screaming of the terns uh and I, as i mentioned before it's a, it is actually a brownfield post industrial site in the early 60s um gary was under communist rule this was a oil part of an oil refinery site so you can see there's still pipes and various other industrial remnants still on site uh, including these pylons. Now, one of the pylons became famous because it was uh, a nesting opportunity again for cormorants, great cormorants. And one of the pylons on site, up until a few years ago, where the lies a story, um, was home to 80 nests. Uh, unbelievable. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the birds. So the birds on migration, the, I suppose the, the, the three um, types of birds which are really, really do attract the birders and the photographers are the large birds on migration, the pelicans, the storks and the birds of prey. And, but, it, but also it's important scientifically, the whole site, um, what you get is people like these wonderful people who are staring at the skies actually recording the numbers of migrants that are coming across and they feed it into the international um, database Treptelum, which is a wonderful thing to all of us we can access in fact i access the data for borgas last year's autumn count we don't know too much about figures because i'm only going to concentrate on three species now the first species i'm going to look at is the white stork and it says here that 181,000 white storks went across the Borgas area in autumn 2021. Um, Astounding number of birds. If you think about that 180,000, we're talking over probably a six week period, middle of August to the start of, um, start of September. Um, in fact, I got uh, when I went the first time and I was experienced the autumn count, I, I actually got there late for storks. Um, you'll see that the biggest number was 55,000 um, 
hold on a second, 55,000 on the 20th of August. I got there in September, but I still one day saw 1,500, a flock of 1,500. And it's just a, a, a wonderful sight. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have experienced this big bird mi migration. The, other, the next species I want to concentrate on is the great white pelican. And we can see that the number of those was over 31,000 were counted over the autumn migration. The biggest number was five and a half September later. So all these different species are moving at different times. Sometimes you'll see them together, but there is a, uh, e e each species has its own migration time. Mm -hmm. But you are likely on site to see pelicans more often because a lot of them stop at the Mandra and Borgas lakes and then come to the breakwater to fish before they go on to their breeding grounds. Species I wanted to go on to because of the raptors are, are wonderful as well is the biggest number is the lesser spotted eagle. Over 47,000 were recorded in a, a, around a six week period with oh, nearly 12,000 seen going over on the 24th of September. Astounding numbers. Um, and if you're lucky enough, sometimes the sky, they're very, they're small points in the sky if it's a particularly hot day. Um, but there are other times, there are other days when you're standing on the roof of that centre and they're literally 50 um, stunning. So here's an example, these are great whites on migration, um, wonderful birds. Um, and the white pelican roots, they can, they can travel 500 kilometres a day. They don't always do it. 50% of the population are moving. If you have a look at the map on the left, you'll probably see, a, just about see Constanta. Um, and just above there, you'll see a sort of like triangular bit, which is the top of Romania, where the Danube Delta is, which butts onto Ukraine. And 50% of these white pelicans are going to there to to breed. They don't actually breed uh, at Poda, and they don't. Act, they used to breed at Mandra Lake, but they don't anymore. They're moving on to Romania. Um, some will be breeding in Turkey as well. Uh, and if we then compare it, we, uh, at the centre you also get Dalmatian pelican. Now you can see with the great white, um, there's uh, worldwide 300,000 estimated population. The Dalmatian is a seriously threatened bird. There's a population of only 12,000 and a lot of conservation efforts have gone into this bird. And this is a, this is a board that's at the front of the Poda Reserve to give information about that cons the conservation efforts that have been going on to, uh, for this bird. Um, unfortunately, um, there have been, been some really positive results um, because of these efforts. But unfortunately, this year, they've been affected by avian flu. So it's one, one step forward, two steps back for the species, unfortunately. But both of these, the Dalmatian and the Great White, uh, the biggest pelicans in the world uh, of the pelican species. They're absolutely massive birds. I mean, look at look at those figures. Fifteen kilos, a wingspan up to three and a half, over eight feet. Um, just massive birds, um, uh, eating three or four pounds of fish every day. Uh, struggling, you know. There's lots of lot, lots of things happening to these big birds. There's, you know, we know there's uh, worldwide the drainage of wetlands, and of course pollutants. Um, because they eat fish, they can be regarded as pests, um, particularly on in the Middle East. There's a lot of um, large industrial fishing lakes in Israel, and also they get hunted for their bills as well. And as said, uh, I've mentioned latterly, avian flu, uh, flu. But what I was struck with, because this was my first time, I mean, I'd seen pelicans, but I hadn't seen them migrating. And what really struck me is if you look at a pelican, well, it's, it's a bit sort of prehistoric looking, they look a bit ungainly. They've got this massive pouch and a big bill, quite ugly. But when you see hundreds in the air, it's one of the, it, it's literally grown men in tears it's that they they fly silently and with such ease uh, it's just a wonderful sight and you can then see 
why, how they've evolved into being these wonderful flying machines. Then we got the white stork. The white stork uh, uh, is quite a successful bird all across um, mainland Europe. Um, the white stalks here. That there will be some um, breeding um, locally in the in the local village fishing village just south of the reserve. There was no non breeding on the site, but just south of the reserve in the village, they had. It was like every village had a couple of storks nests, and every town had about ten, um, which is sort of common in central and um, eastern Europe. This was our local cheeky one who used to come to the reserve regularly for food, looking for frogs and, and, and amphibians. And, and on the right, this is a, I know it's a poorly taken photo, but this is me rushing out when I saw at the front of the centre, it just strode down the main track um, into the grass and got this two and a half foot, three foot um, dice snake. Um, you can just about see it beak, uh, and then we we frightened it off because it it kept raiding raiding the little ponds in front of the reserve, which are particularly interesting for the children. Is becoming rapidly frogless just because of this one bird. So we ran out and scared it, and and it flew up into the air, and it was a sight because it it had only half engaged with this snake, and still a foot of it was as it was flying was. Uh, outside its beak um, and then birds on migration of course the raptors we talked about it looked at the trectellan um, numbers this is the great uh, if you're there during migrating you you will see lots of different kinds of eagles but this is the eagle that you will see the most of um, compared to something like a golden eagle or a um, white-tailed eagle they're a lot smaller um, it, think of a buzzard and a bit bigger um, it's around 60 centimetres compared to a metre of the big eagles um, but nonetheless impressive birds particularly when you see them in numbers and the graphic on the right shows you their wintering ground so you can see they're extensively winter in central um, and east Africa and then you see the migration route, the turquoise colour is showing you the route, which is the Via Pontica. But this is an example, can be an example of one of distance migrants because they're, they're not breeding in Bulgaria. They're, ten, they're going up into northern, the northern latitudes. So they're going on maybe, maybe Romania, but they're going on through Ukraine. They're going to Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia and that area. And it's true of a lot of the the um, species of of eagles that are passing through on the Pontica that they're travelling miles and miles, and they're literally going right over the east of Russia and north of Russia. Um, stunning journeys that they take. And then, of course, birds on migration. Well, it, it, we're, we're in a wetland. We're in a marshland. So you'd expect wading birds. So these birds and um, spotted red shank there in beautiful breeding plumage on the top left, uh, rough down below, and then top right curly sandpiper and glossy ibis. There were others. But I will also use these as examples because when I got up there this year, um, the first week, it was just full. There'd be full of spotted shanks and roughs woke up and it was, up, it was about two out of 60 and then a couple of days later it was they were supplying pipers where there was around six feeding up and moving some of them were only moving to a little bit farther north to breathe breed um, uh, whereas others were, will be moving into Romania and of course in the winter I've just yeah just realized yes in the winter they will be supplanted on the reserve with the wintering ducks, the winter geese and the swan species. And of course, they get through the reserve, a lot, a lot of small birds, a lot of passerines, birds that we actually get on our migration shift. A lot of the warblers would be the same shift chaff. We had a big drop of lesser white throat one day um, and white throat. And interestingly, there was very little rain um, when I went in the spring, I, I think it was about three hours and it was a real downpour and of course, and it was very windy and it stopped about three o'clock in the afternoon. And at 3.30, we had this drop and 
along that track, I had four cuckoos ca had come in and six hoopo. Um, and it's interesting what the, the passerines do. They just, it's literally a corridor. This, it's about, I don't know, a kilometre up at the area, which, and then really, and they'll literally hop through all those travelling north and then coming back, travelling south. And then over the, over the marshlands, over the reed beds, you'd often get bee eaters feeding voraciously um, on the insects just above the reeds. And of course, because um, it's a migration route, there are a couple of, uh, this is not on site, by the way, but it's in the Bourgas area. The, there are a couple of ringing stations the, the day we uh, happened on the guys uh, wonderful people I mean the, the one guy here he gets six weeks holiday a year and he and he does six weeks seven days a week lives in his caravan and, and rings birds wonderful um, and the day we happened on them they had got a lure for black cap they were studying um, th there was some thought that black caps there was a um, a, a decrease that year um and that, that, so, so obviously these, these, just like any ringing station anywhere in the world, they're really important um, conservation tools. And then, of course, we've got the breeding birds on site. It's a marshland. And so you expect a lot of wetland birds. And the first thing that strikes you is the amount of cormorants on site, both great and pig, um, pygmy cormorants. It's very important for pygmy cormorants, which only really exist in Eastern Europe. And the Black Sea, the whole of the Black Sea, probably at any one time holds about half their population. Um, Poda being one of the important sites for their breeding. And you would notice that on the left hand side, I've gone and used the same photo of the pylon. And therein lies the story. So the second time I went, I looked at the first day and I went, uh, there's less pylons. And there the story went in 2021 and the pylon fell down. Now, they were a bit rickety and rusty, uh, but when they've got 80 great cormorant nests on them and fledglings in. And they defecate with acidic faeces that which we're finding even more weaker points in the structure. The structure eventually failed and fell over and was horizontal in the marshes. Luckily, when it fell over, the the uh, birds had fledged. Um, but there you go. The effects of bird bird poo. Um, Important um, site. It's the only site on the uh, western side of the Black Sea where there are breeding spoonbills. And there's this wonderful area at the far end. You probably saw the hide on stilts at that end. Um, there's this wonderful area which has got a grey heronry, but it's also got night heronry and it's also got little egrets nesting and great white egrets and a couple of spoonbill nests all in this one area and they seem they seem to get along and yeah more more water birds on site so there's lots of, there are, there are turn rafts at the reserve and typically although there was a lot of sandwich turns around they don't breed there they breed, breed on that northern lake um, but there was a lot of common terns bred on site and black wing stilts as well. Um, and then, uh, we, uh, and there's lots of harrier nests. I, I think there's up to six areas on site. And obviously there's a lot, lot of small birds, reed warblers, sedge warblers, great reed warblers, some other warbler species um, that breed on site. And just to the left, uh, so that's where my little room on the left and then you'll see some steps going up and there's three nests in that little alcove um, of martins and swallows. Okay, so poda is also great for butterflies and other animals. You get a few herpetologists going there because they're liable to see interesting frogs and reptiles and snakes. A Caspian whip snake, I'm told, on the right hand side, and we've got uh, see a little baby European pond turtle there by my thumb. 
uh, big hedgehog that was, seriously large. Uh, praying mantis as well one day I managed to get a photo of. That I was going to briefly talk about some negative human effects that were seen on or about the site top left don't stare at it too much because it's not very nice it's a dead dolphin that we saw in the spring in fact two rolled up uh, on the top of the reserve on the little beachy area on the edge of the sea uh, and I thought well we're near a port we're near a big port there is a bit of industry you know they're in the wrong area at the wrong time could be ships whatever but when I came back a couple of days later, I happened on a article, and it's a die. And these uh, dolphins, in particular, have been seen all along the Black Sea coast, west and east, all the way down to Turkey, which is a good 250 miles away from where we were, along the Romanian coast and along the Ukrainian coast as well. And it's a direct result of the war. Lots of bombing has upset the sonar of these animals. They drift into areas and they, they get, they're basically lost and they don't know where they are. Um, interesting topical uh, human effect. Then if we go down, we've got the common, that common picture of the common turn again. As I said, there's a, it's a very successful breeding bird on site, um, but their numbers have gone down on site. And that's uh, and uh, they've analysed the problem, and it's a, it's probably a worldwide problem that's uh, a lot of turn turn species are suffering, and it's microplastics, and the microplastics affect the little fish babies that the turn feeds on, so they're having to go farther to fish and get enough food for the young, and so they're not breeding as successfully. Top right is an example while I was there. Uh, one of the herpetologists, actually, a young, young lad who was really into his snakes, who you saw his hands before, actually, he picked up this t beautiful turtle dove, which had flown directly into a power line. Um, and the time before, when I was there in 2020, I was uh, talking to some of the guests on the roof. And we were watching birds in the sky, and I turned around, and I was unfortunately... In, enough to see three swans go over and one just struck a power line and that was it it was it just spiraled to its mm, a very nice conclusion luckily the guests didn't see it um so it is an issue there uh, they the power lines tend to be a bit lower than uk ones um and so it's important the research they're doing at the center onto this uh, because it's such an important migratory flyway and interesting another topical uh, human effect was covid so the birds so you know there's the black wing stilt again and just before i think one of the slides right at the start i showed you the bridge that went over the canal that connect andra lake to the sea um, and just before that probably just a quarter of a mile before it butted up by the canal there's four little fishing um, places um, with a couple of picnic tables and during COVID, Bulgarians were just like us. They were desperate to get out to green spaces wherever the green space. It got rammed uh, with people and it got rammed with litter. And the jackals, jackals, they act like wolves at night, uh, but in the day they're pretty solitary. But when there's, um, when there's a bit of food around, they tend to hunt in packs. And so they came to this picnic area, which is only just down around the road from the reserve, and then realised, hmm, there's a lot of bird's eggs on site. And so they trashed the uh, black winged stilts nests that season. But it's all right, they bounced back this year. So, um, And the jackals have gone back to where they usually are, which is around. I used to hear them at night. Um, uh, around five kilometres away from the reserve. And this to me, although this is, we, we're now getting to the end of the presentation, this to me is probably the most important thing. What was I doing there? I was volunteering there. What was I doing there? I was talking to people. I was talking to guests, like you get people talking to you at an RSPB reserve. Um, so I was involved with the engagement. And over the month, there was nearly 500 visitors. 30% of them were children who'd come with their parents. Majority of them were Bulgarian, 
but there was a good mix of other European nations. Uh, and the other European nations, interestingly, they tended to be birders, either coming solo or in a couple or with birding uh, holiday groups. And on top of that, we also um, talked to 16 local school groups and they were age, ranged from five years old to 15 years old and they could be parties of 15 to 30 um but there was a lot of people um and i think that's the to me that is a really important part of the research so to conclude and conclude what we've talked about but hopefully i've given you um uh, an idea of the importance of the via pontica flyway uh it's important not just for us to look at birds and um but it, it, engagement, science and conservation. And, and give you a flavour of Poda in this context, it's at this narrow bit, it's at, around Burgas, uh, where, where the flyway narrows. And, but Poda itself is important for, there's a lot of breeding birds on site, and Poda is a tool for engagement. So um, I beg you to go or, or donate, go to the BSPB site, it's quite sophisticated. Um, and yeah, engage with it. And I uh, here's a few acknowledgements and references, particularly as some of the pictures. And there we are. We're at the end. And that wonderful man on the right hand side is uh, alongside me uh, is is Rado, who is a, a great friend who was there both times. This second time he was probably there most days. And there on the left, that's me washing. It was lovely to get back to basics. And just to the right is, is, a, is a, you're hanging your washing. And in the autumn time, the first time, that's a fig tree. So hang your washing and eat a fresh fig. Eh? What can be better? There we are. So I'm open to any questions. Kate, if you want to visit that reserve, where do you stay? Obviously, we can't all stay in that room on the reserve. Is no, <laughs> no, Kate, no, it's a good question. It, it's a really accessible reserve because you get direct flights to Borgas, and Borgas Airport is just north of the city. So, in a taxi or a bus, it's half an hour to three quarters of an hour away from the reserve. The reserve itself is actually on a main bus route, it only takes 15 minutes into the city. Um, so, it's easy to get to the reserve. So, you can either stay in Borgas or just south of the reserve i think i mentioned um a village where we got our supplies um and called crimore and that that's it's not the most beautiful um uh, beach but it it's got lots of very cheap accommodation and when i say cheap i mean cheap and clean and interestingly this second time most of the accommodation was for ukrainians um, before the season started, uh, who were escaping the the start of the war. Um, but Kate, you'll have no problems getting very, uh, very cheap accommodation right up to expensive five star hotels in Borgas, which is, as I say, is 15 minutes away from the reserve. Thank you. A lovely talk. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Good. Pleasure. I thought Gihan would have a question. I, I was actually <laughs> mulling over what to ask because uh, obviously with my interest in photography, I was wondering how close you get to the birds and also from the heights, whether the photography is any good. There are days when you can get really close and not only to the resident species like that you saw the waders there, um, and glossy ibis. We, we had this glossy ibis and the photographers were going, is it real? Because it looks as though it's got batches in it and you change the batches because it was always in this wonderful place by the photography hide. And and then, of course, on migratory days, I, I did explain there are some days where the birds are very high up in the sky. But there are other days where they're, they're coming down, you know, 50 to 100 foot. They're close. And so it's patience. But, but the one good thing about the site is you've got the other lakes so there's plenty of other opportunities, particularly at an Sobsco Lake where the flamingos are. You can get, it's a great place to take photographs. But um, for the pelicans, um, 
they all a lot of the great whites stack up at Borgas Lake and really you need to get round it you need a four wheel drive um hire cars and not you can hire four wheel drive obviously um, but you can get very close to them very close thank you Jeff. okay thank you Brilliant. very much thank you very coming. much everybody for spending time and, and 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 if you do get chance please go there because as I said to Gihan, there's lots of local opportunities. It's not just that reserve because of that migration route. There are a lot of other opportunities to see birds. I met people. I, I got around 160 species, but I was meeting birders who were getting 200 species in a week. So if you're a birder, it's a, 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 an amazing place. Uh, and if you can't get there, do look at the BS, the, the Bulgarian Society's site. Um, they do really good conservation work. And if you can be prepared for a little donation, that would be fantastic. Okay, everybody, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>